Not every barbershop throws your hair in the trash, but I bet you never thought about where it goes. Well, I sure didn't. One nonprofit collects hair from around the country because it turns out it's actually pretty good at soaking up oil spills. Have you ever thought about all the trash you make? The average American generates about four and a half pounds of solid waste every single day. And what's that look like? Coffee grounds, body waste, single-use cups, snacks, paper scraps. Oh, takeout today, huh? Even though it may seem like trash is piling up with nowhere to go, there are people working hard to transform it into something useful. Here are 10 everyday items that are recycled from worldwide waste. But first, I need a coffee to start my day. Seven out of 10 Americans drink this stuff daily. And almost a third of them get their fresh brew from coffee shops. That's a lot of coffee grounds. One Ukrainian company takes those pulverized caffeine berries and turns them into sunglasses. The company Ochis makes its biodegradable frames in Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. The barista discards 11 pounds of coffee grounds every day. An Ochis staff member collects these grounds a few times a week. Turning coffee grounds into glasses keeps them out of landfills. That's good news because when organic waste breaks down without oxygen, it creates methane, a powerful type of planet warming pollution. At the company's production facility, the first step is drying them out. The team grinds them into an ultra-fine powder. Then they blend the powder with plant oils. Workers spread the mixture into molds. Some Ochi's frames also include flowers, coconut, or other decorative accents. Then they put these molds into a press and allow the oil and coffee blend to harden under pressure. Workers here place the decorated plates in a machine that cuts them into basic shapes. These will become the rims and temples of the glasses. A team of craftspeople shapes and polishes the pieces. A laser engraver adds finishing touches. Then the team puts the pieces together. Я самого малку любила щось собирати, розбирати. Це напевно в мене з дитинства. After final inspection, the frames are ready for lenses. If you're like me, when I trim my beard or brush my hair, I wind up with hairs all over the bathroom sink. Humans grow almost 12 meters of hair over their lifetime. That's about as long as a bus. It turns out one kilogram of hair can soak up around five times its weight in oil. Since the year 2000, a nonprofit called Matter of Trust has been collecting hair, weaving it into mats, and using those to soak up oil spills. Founder Lisa Gauthier sources hair from salons in over 30 countries. Maybe the weirdness makes it, you know, just more interesting. I don't know. The felters lay out the human hair on this bed of dull nails and start to layer it with animal fur and fleece. Then these machines tighten the fibers. 
The final product looks and feels like a doormat. Feel how like sturdy that is. It's really sturdy. The idea to use hair to clean oil spills started in 1989 with Phil McCrory, a hairstylist from Alabama. He was watching the Exxon Valdez oil spill in William Sound, Alaska. And on CNN, uh, it was showing the otters covered in oil and the water around them a little bit cleaner. Phil looked down at the oily head of hair he was shampooing. And it just sort of snapped for him. You shampoo because hair collects oil. I cut, you know, a pound of hair every couple of days. All of this could be going to clean up oil spills. So 10 years after Phil came up with the idea, Lisa partnered with him to scale up. At first, they stuffed nylon stockings with hair to make booms shaped like sausage. We're gonna stop doing as many booms as we have because they needed the nylons, which was again plastic, to hold them together. And we're gonna start doing more mats because mats add surface area. And so it just collects even more oil. For millions of parents, packing lunch for their kids is a morning ritual. And who remembers getting these? In the U.S., just over half of communities have the ability to recycle them. But in Thailand, school children help turn them into bricks and roofing. A company called Tetra Pak makes the cartons and sponsors the program. The cartons end up here at Eco-Friendly Thai, a recycling company that specializes in beverage containers and used paper. The Ratchaburi plant processes about 12 million cartons a month. First, they have to be broken down to make it easier to separate the cardboard from the plastic and aluminum. The walls of the cartons made by Tetra Pak have six layers. All of them can be recycled on their own, but many recycling facilities don't have machines that can process them all at once. About 75% of a carton is paper, which provides structure. Polyethylene plastic makes up 20% and helps seal the packaging. The last 5% is aluminum. A thin foil helps keep the contents fresh and extends the product shelf life. And a special heating process sterilizes both the product and the package, making some items shelf-stable for up to a year. The hydropulper breaks up the layers into tiny pieces. Then the boxes go through three filters to separate and remove the paper. Each filter is finer than the last. Any wastewater gets pumped back into the pulper. The remaining plastic and aluminum end up here at the dump screen. The pulp is trucked to another plant and will be turned into toilet paper and cardboard. Meanwhile, the leftover mix of polyethylene plastic and aluminum is headed to Eco-Friendly's plant in Notapuri. It's called Paliel for short. First, workers crush it with a coarse grinder. Then it goes through another round of cleaning to filter out any remaining paper pulp. Next, a hot air dryer removes moisture. Workers feed it into a second grinder. Then it's ready for the extruder which heats the ground material. Temperatures reach up to 392 degrees Fahrenheit. The compressor uses a cooling system to shape the polyel mix. It cools for three minutes in the mold, and voila, eco brick. There are 2.4 million miles of asphalt roads in the U.S. And how come it seems like whenever you're running late, all of it seems to be under construction? Well, at least one New York company found a way to make 100% recycled asphalt that's actually cheaper than new asphalt. On a typical day, 
Green Asphalt receives up to 50 dump trucks worth of product. So back here is where trucks full of New York City's asphalt, old millings come in and get dumped every day. Most of them will get right back in line and leave the plant filled with fresh, recycled asphalt. But the first step is crushing up the millings. That machine on top of the pile is our excavator. He grabs the material, throws it in the crusher, and that's where we process the material. A magnet picks out any metals. Garbage, debris, leaves, the stuff that you see laying all over the New York City streets does not make good asphalt. If any plastic or road striping or fabric from the road base gets in it, that gets picked out by hand. A conveyor belt carries the pieces through screens that sort them into three sizes. Black sand, small rocks, and bigger ones. They'll be mixed back together in different combinations, depending on whether the asphalt will be used for potholes, private roads, or highways. Then it's time to turn up the heat. This flaming drum warms and mixes the asphalt at the same time. After it's reached a temperature of 300 degrees, it's properly mixed, it comes out of the drum. We douse it with a half a percent of a paraffin oil. Paraffin oil is still a type of fossil fuel, but recycling has lower overall emissions compared to making new product. The paraffin helps rejuvenate old asphalt, which degrades as it sits on roads. And basically brings it back to life. These mixes have to stay hot in order to spread onto roads smoothly, so the clock is ticking. Asphalt has to be made and sold within 24 hours. You can't leave it up there for too long. The final product is temporarily stored in silos. The company runs quality tests every day to make sure each batch meets government standards, which vary depending on its final use. Different things on bridges, different things for tunnels, different things for airport runways, things like that. Matt Harrison runs those tests, which include checking how much air and moisture is in each batch. Like a lot of people that don't use a lot of recycled material, don't think it can be done because they don't process it the way we do, you know, like they don't test for all the little things that we do. Despite the extra steps, Green Asphalt says its fully recycled mix is the cheapest option. Lunchtime is one of my favorites. All those choices. Ooh, sushi. But all those choices you have also leads to waste. In the US alone, we toss 119 billion pounds of food waste out every year. But one company called Ictios collects fish skins from sushi restaurants and saves them from the trash by turning them into fashion leather. At the production facility, the first step is removing any leftover flesh from the defrosted skins. Ictios gives these scraps to another company that composts them into fertilizer. The team sorts the skins by size and refreezes them, then drops the frozen blocks in this rotating drum. Tossing the skins around removes most of the scales, while water and chemicals clean them. So it's a bit like soaps that we use to get all the fat out of the skin. That part is key because the fats are what make the fish skin smell fishy. Early samples of the fish leather skipped this step, and people noticed. The answer was like, whoa, it's crazy, it's so beautiful, it's uh, very interesting, but it's a bit smelly. The skin spin through the drum again, this time with tannins that will strengthen them and help color stick. These tannins come from vegetables. Many sources of vegetable contain polyphenol, which has the ability to transform a hide into a leather. Vegetable tanning actually goes back thousands of years, but more dangerous chemical methods became dominant over the 20th century. The team flattens out the skins. Then they drape them on a rack and wait for the tannins to soak in. Le but étant que plus un cuir met du temps à sécher, meilleure sera la souplesse. Once air dried, the skins go through this machine, which weakens fibers so the leather will be softer. Now it's time to add color. Workers soak the skins in the first round of dyeing, then lay them flat again and begin another series of drying steps. Then they stretch them by pinning them to metal plates for about a day. 
we stretch it as far as we can so that we can have the maximum surface on the leather. At this point, it feels like a thinner version of traditional leather. It's a little bit like snake leather when you look at the, the grain, the aesthetic. The leather can now be sprayed with dye for its final shade and a finishing coat. You can finish the leather by applying several dyes and resin on the leather so it will bring protection and a brightness to the leather. The spray also contains natural oils that help smooth out the surface. Dans un premier temps du noir brillant, donc qui est vraiment un grand classique de ce qu'on propose, qui est le cuir aujourd'hui le plus demandé. This is the final product. The marine leathers are today a little bit more expensive than the classic leathers, but cheaper than the exotic leathers like snakes, like crocodile or others. Lunch is done. Delish as always. Now you've taken care of the food waste. And hopefully that plastic will get recycled too. But what about those chopsticks? China alone produces 80 billion chopsticks per year. Enough that one group sued to stop food delivery apps there from automatically giving them away. In Vancouver, people use over 100,000 chopsticks every day. And this company, Chop Value, has been upcycling the used utensils into furniture since 2016. And here's the company founder. And this is how the process looks like from raw material to end product. First, they sort the chopsticks on the custom-built shaker table. These neat stacks are easier to work with. Then, they dip the sticks into a water-based resin. That provides a protective coating before they roast in a massive oven for five hours. The 200 degree heat kills all the germs. It smells like a bakery. They need to get separated again so they can be spread out evenly for the next step. You can take your frustration out on the day inside here. <laughs> They're weighed precisely this batch will make Chop Value's thinnest tile. So about 560 grams. Then comes the big squeeze. A hydraulic machine, also invented by Box Team, compresses the chopsticks with hundreds of pounds of pressure. The heart of the process that densifies um, like a, a cake, a mat of chopsticks, into a new uniform engineered material, which is the base modular tile used for all of our end products. The tiles can be sanded and assembled into furniture, and also cut into smaller products like coasters or even domino pieces. This desk sells for just under a thousand US dollars. That's about three times what you'd pay at Ikea, but comparable to the price of a desk made from solid wood. This piece is made from about 10,000 chopsticks. Chop Value also takes custom orders, we could do large countertops or boardroom tables or pretty much anything like that. I quit smoking a few years ago, but I still get a daily reminder of this nasty habit. It turns out cigarette butts are the most littered item on earth. People drop 4.5 trillion of them every year. In northern India, Naman Gupta's company recycles dirty butts into mosquito repellents and stuffing. For you guessed it, stuffed animals. I am completely okay with anybody consuming cigarettes or smoking, but if they are unable to dispose their cigarette waste wisely, then that is a bit of a concern for me. A network of hundreds of people collect butts off the streets of Noida. A company called Code Effort pays them about 300 rupees per kilo. That's just over $4. Code Effort delivers the waste to the homes of contractors where they pull apart the filters, paper, and tobacco. They hand off the tobacco to nearby farms to be composted. The paper gets dumped into this industrial grinder and treated with an organic binder. The sheets dry out in the sun, then get cut, packaged, and sold online or in local shops. The paper and remaining nicotine act as a mosquito repellent when burned. For the mosquito repellents, we have a brand name NMOS, that is an abbreviation for no mosquito. To use it, you just have to burn it from one end. The company is introducing scented versions sometime in the next year. The plastic fibers from the filters go into the same grinder. They are then soaked in sterilizing chemicals for 24 hours, 
which leaves them looking like cotton. The chemical mixture is a company secret, but the processes involved in recycling the butts have been independently certified as safe. And this is the last stage where the cotton is fluffed and carded into the prescribed form and this is helpful to ensure that the final products like soft toys, cushions and keychains are very soft and comfortable. All these products are sold online and offline through various mediums. If you're like me, you might now feel a bit stressed by all that waste. Maybe it's time for a getaway. A nice sunny beach, perhaps? But if you've ever had a pair of flip-flops break, you know they're useless afterwards. But one Kenyan company figured out how to create art from flip-flop trash. And it's reclaimed over 10 million of them. That's a lot of broken sandals. They cost like a dollar. The problem with that is they break very easily. So what you have is a huge menace, flip-flops everywhere. In Kenya, the coasts are often littered with them. So trashes come from even as far as from India, Philippines to over here. So sometimes we are, uh, we are shocked. We have a network of collectors that collect flip-flops from our weekly beach cleanup efforts at the coast of Kenya. When you bring the flip-flops to us, we pay you an equivalent of 30 cents US per kilogram. You'd need to bag more than 25 pairs to make the minimum daily wage of a typical worker in Nairobi. All told, collectors usually bring in about one ton of flip-flops per week. That's more than 3,000 sandals. First, the shoes go through a thorough hand wash using water and detergent. We live in a very hot climate. It takes probably two to three hours for them to dry, and then our artists will come to pick them and use them uh, to make the sculptures. For small and medium sculptures, workers die cut the flip-flops into templates. Then use a non-toxic glue to bind the shoes together. Remember, we're using a tiny flip-flop, so you have to build up before you're able to carve down. Then our artists will carve them out into a finished product. The company has around 90 employees. Many of their artists used to make traditional Kenyan wood carvings. But that kind of work has dwindled since the early 2000s when Kenya scaled back logging, which made raw materials harder to come by. When I used to do woodworking, I never thought of destruction of, of environment. These artists say working with a softer material isn't too different from working with wood. The knives and sanding tools are the same, but you do get fewer splinters. The end product will be a crab. It takes almost two hours to complete a piece. For larger pieces, artists repurpose old insulation from shipping containers as a base and cover them with flip-flops. And that's why with the bigger sculptures, you'll notice that they have a contour look, while with the smaller ones, there's a stripy look. Nearly every part of the process is done by hand, and it can take up to three months to complete some of the larger pieces. The only time we use a machinery is when we come here to sand. So after they're done carving with a knife, they'll come here and sit down and use these sanding machines to smoothen the sculptures. I'm gonna walk out of here because it's too noisy. The company keeps a stock of marine animals, like turtles and whales, in keeping with the clean ocean theme. There's also safari-inspired carvings, like elephants and giraffes, which are the best sellers. People say that they love them because of their twisted necks, and they also have beautiful eyelashes. The sandal shavings get repurposed. We have a shredder in the back that shreds them into smaller pieces like this. And from here, we're able to make mattresses that we donate to a refugee program in northern Kenya. At least we don't have to pack soap for a holiday. The hotel supplies them, right? It's estimated that people throw away five million bars of used soap every day, not to mention the packages. But a company called Clean the World recycles old soaps and gives them to people in developing countries. It's given out more than 73 million of them so far. And it all started out in 2009 with some dudes in a garage shaving bars with vegetable peelers. We would sit here and just scrape it off and make sure it was cleaned up and good to go. 
Today, a giant machine called a refiner cleans the dirt and hair from the top layers, pushing out uniform noodle-like strands from all the differently sized bars. Those strands get heated and mixed with a solution of water and bleach for seven to eight minutes to sanitize them. A conveyor belt brings the sterilized mix to a final refiner before it gets molded. A long bar of recycled soap rolls out from the extruder as it's cut into individual bars. Now we have a pretty good idea of how much trash people throw out over the course of their lives. But did you know you can continue making waste after you die? It can take an embalmed body buried in a casket up to 12 years to break down, sometimes leaving toxic chemicals behind. A Dutch company called Loop Biotech came up with a way to compost human bodies into soil in just a matter of months. All you need is some shrooms, or more specifically, mycelium. Yeah, I see them. We got some friends. Bob Hendricks searches for the building blocks for a loop coffin in Delft's Hout Forest in the Netherlands. It's easy to find mushrooms, but it's hard to find the specific one you need. <laughs> Back at Loop's headquarters, Bob and his team mix the mycelium with wet sawdust and spray it with a secret sauce that helps it grow. Then they seal it in a plastic mold shaped like a coffin. This part of the process is also a secret. Fungus fills in the empty space and it dries within a week. It's a building technique that Bob has been experimenting with for years. Right now, we tend to work with dead materials while I envision a world in which we work together with organisms. The final product is light but sturdy. It's almost like a sort of styrofoam material, so it's really rigid, yet it's super lightweight. It can carry up to 440 pounds. Each coffin is lined with a layer of moss sourced from a local farm. The moss has two functions, in that it helps to decompose the body faster and rich in biodiversity, and the other one is to give humans the experience of becoming part of the cycle of life. A body interned in a loop coffin should not be embalmed or wear any synthetic materials, so it can transform into soil faster. That was an exciting prospect for Johannes Penheisen. The 82-year-old doctor became one of the first people buried in a loop coffin last year. This is his final resting place, in a special area designated by the Dutch government for natural burials. It became something like, like, like a beautiful thing, you know, because it was a special coffin and he really liked it. Most people's deaths leave a much larger footprint. A conventionally buried body contains a mix of over 200 chemicals, from tobacco residues to dry cleaning chemicals, pesticides, heavy metals, and embalming fluids. It can take up to 12 years for an embalmed body to turn into a skeleton, but soft tissues release toxic chemicals and microbes after only a few months. And traditional coffins contain preservatives, paint, and have metal handles. All of these substances can leach into soil and water, making it unhealthy for the living. Loop coffins can fix this because of a process called mycoremediation. That means that mushrooms will chow down on almost anything, even pollution. These fungi, of course, can have a lot of intake of um, heavy metals and all kinds of uh, chemical components because they, they store it in their hefe, in their, in their fungus body. So from now on, let's not look at these as waste. They're just not recycled properly. My name is Kevin Riley from the World Wide Waste Team. We make videos about garbage and the creative ways people deal with it. Ooh. Trash flowers, my favorite. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. And we also read the comments. So if you have an idea for a story you'd like to see, let us know. And finally, if you would like to watch any full episodes of the excerpt you've just seen, just click 